Good evening, everyone. This is the Monroe Street Bikeway Study, Phase 2 Community Workshops. Today, we're going to be presenting some roadway concepts. This is um, Ralph Garcia with the City of Santa Clara. Oops, sorry. Welcome. Thank you for being here. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the project website. You can connect with us via voicemail at the number shown on the screen, 408-320-7060, by emailing the project team at monroestudy at altago.com, visiting the city's website, santaclaraca.gov slash bike pet projects, or you can um, use the QR code shown on the screen. There's also a survey uh, accessible via the project website. So just to go over the agenda for tonight, I'll go over some introductions of the project team. We'll look at the project overview and the activities completed to date. We'll share some of the corridor parking and collision analysis results. We'll also have some concept designs and we'll also take some interactive polling on, on the concepts. This will be followed by a question and answer session and we'll briefly go over the next steps in the project. So once again, I'm Ralph Garcia, the project manager. Um, also from the city side on the project team, we have Michael Liu, assistant public works director, Steve, Tan, Steve Chan, transportation manager, Carol Sherriott, principal transportation planner, and Nicole He, associate civil engineer. Um, our consulting team, Alta Planning, is here tonight. They'll take you the rest of the way. So I'd like to introduce Jeff Knowles, Principal Planner for Alta Planning, and he'll introduce his team. Great. Thanks so much, Ralph. Uh, again, I'm Jeff Knowles. I'm a principal at Alta Planning and Design. We're the consultant uh, supporting the city with the Monroe Street Bikeway Study. I've got my colleagues here joined with me, Ben Frazier and Katrina Ortiz. We also have uh, Robert and Kaz from our IT team just to help us uh, with this presentation. All right, a couple of housekeeping items first. If this is your first time using Zoom, I wanted to share with you some things you can do to make your experience more meaningful. First thing is in the bottom corner, there's an icon called participants. You can use that to rename yourself. If you'd like to be anonymous or just use your initials, feel free to do so. There's also a Q&A button at the bottom. At any point during the meeting, you can type in a question or provide feedback. If you are thinking that you may not be able to remember something, go ahead and type it in. We'll be saving those until the Q&A, but if you do have issues with IT, that's a good thing, and Ben or our IT team can help uh, troubleshoot along the way. Uh, down the road, we will have a Q&A session that Ralph mentioned before. And this is your opportunity to raise your hand, uh, and then we will be recognized. We will be able to come off of mute and ask a question of the team or provide feedback on any of the concepts you are going to see tonight. And that raise hand function will illuminate. You'll have that opportunity once we get to the Q&A session. We're going to be doing a lot of interactive polling in this presentation. We really want to get your feedback. Uh, with these early draft concepts. And so we're using something called Mentimeter. So what we'd like for everyone to do is to open a separate browser window or use your cell phone or a tablet and go to menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I.com and enter the code 56903478. Again, menti.com 56903478. Go ahead and take a moment to open up a browser window because we'll need that throughout the presentation. And to test, to make sure that everybody's able to do that, we've got a first question. This is really understand who's in the virtual room with us. We want to know where you live in relation to the study quarter. Do you live on Monroe Street, in the neighborhood within a few blocks of Monroe? a different part of Santa Clara, or maybe you're joining us outside of Santa Clara because you have a connection to the corridor, maybe you commute on it, or you uh, travel on it to go to high school. Again, visit menti.com 
and type in 5690. All right. So instant results, instant gratification. One person within a few blocks, one person in a different part of Santa Clara, and one person outside of the Santa Clara. All right, thanks. Looks like Minty's working tonight. I want to talk about our plan process. Phase one, we gather lots of information about the corridor and existing conditions analysis. So we're learning about things about how people park along the street. We learned about traffic conditions. Um, we've got some of that to share tonight. Uh, phase two is where we are. We're developing and sharing roadway concepts. And I mentioned that these are early draft concepts. We're gonna get your feedback tonight uh, and then refine them and then share with you in phase three the impacts that each of the different concepts would have in terms of parking or traffic congestion, uh, all that will be shared and we'll get additional feedback from the public before going to city council in phase four for their review and consideration. Uh, this process is uh, not identifying you know, uh, immediate next steps. We're really just doing a study right now to figure out which concept is the preferred alternative with the community and for city council to review. So we here we are in phase two. There will be a third community workshop later this winter or into early spring. We'll have uh, we'll be meeting with the city's bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee. So we're meeting with them four times. We'll meet with them a third time. Uh, we'll be presenting the public draft plan and review in the spring, and then we we'll go to council, city council, for their review and adoption uh, this summer. So I want to give you a little background on the study corridor. So our study area limits are Lawrence Expressway to San Tomas Expressway on Monroe Street. You can see in the center, Wilcox High School is one of the major destinations along this corridor. Otherwise, it's mostly residential. Our study corridor is 1.7 miles long from east to west. It's a four to five lane roadway, and the posted speed limit is 35 miles per hour. There are currently no continuous bike facilities, but I will note and show you a, a graphic in a minute that there are some existing bike lanes in different segments along the corridor. Uh, it's primarily fronted by houses along with Wilcox High. Some things we've done so far, we've noticed our first two rounds of public workshops. We sent out postcards to a thousand residents within the area. We had eight folks attend our first rounds of workshops. We then attended Bike to Work Day, which was along the Santa Moss Creek Trail near Agnew, and we talked, talked to 30 people. We also had an online survey in our first round with 67 responses. We collected lots of information, about traffic counts, uh, turning movements, so how people are using intersections for vehicles, travel times. We collected bike and pet information. We collected parking counts. We looked at the collisions, vehicle collisions on the corridor, and conducted a site visit um, on the corridor as well. Some of the things that we heard, the public wants safe, comfortable bike facilities. They're interested in improving pedestrian and bicycle crossings on Monroe. And the idea to improve the San Tomas Aquino Creek Trail crossings came up quite a bit in our conversations. So I wanna share with you some of the analysis we've conducted so far. First, in terms of motor vehicle collisions, these are the years 2017 to 2022. There were 114 motor vehicle collisions in our study area. Nine of them involved bicyclists and seven involved pedestrians. Unfortunately, there were two fatal collisions within the study area. The first was a pedestrian that was struck at Augusta Lane, Augusta Place, and then a vehicle collision that resulted in a fatality at Francis Avenue. There were also three collisions with severe injuries and 37 of the collisions involved speeding. The bottom left graphic shows the collisions by time of day and the severity. You can see here, there's more severe and higher numbers of collisions that follow the AM and PM peak commuting periods. So you can see here in orange and in purple in the morning time, seven and 8 AM, have a high number of collisions with greater severity, and then also five o'clock and six o'clock PM typically higher volumes of speed and people going faster. So again, you can see in the top right graphic, the primary crash factor, the kind of the leading indicator for what's causing these collisions is unsafe speeds on the, on the corridor. 
the city also collected parking information uh, over four days during the last week of April. We collected count information on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and a Saturday. And we counted the number of cars parked in Monroe, also 500 feet of every cross street during the peak parking periods, which are 7 to 9 a.m., 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and then 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. overnight. We counted every half hour during those time frames. On the north side of Monroe Street, there are 201 currently legally available parking spaces, and the average number of cars parked in those spaces was 79, so about 39% utilized, which means four out of 10 spaces are filled, six out of 10 would be available during those peak demand periods. On the south side of Monroe, 118 available parking spaces. We counted 43 cars on average during those peak periods with a 36% utilization rate. So on average for the whole corridor, 38% was our utilization rate. And then in terms of side streets, pretty close as well, about 37%. So just over a third parked uh, of, the util of the parking spaces utilized. Now, looking at this and mapping it a little more detail, you can see there is some differences in the corridor in terms of parking demand. The majority of the corridor east of Calabasas Boulevard has a low parking utilization or high availability during peak periods. Parking demand on Monroe and several side streets west of Calabasas, however, means that about seven out of 10 spaces or more are typically used. So pretty high demand during those peak periods. So now I wanna turn our attention to the corridor concepts. In terms of roadway width, the corridor for Monroe is typically 64 feet between curb to curb. You can see in the dark gray lines, that's the existing parking. It's available for the majority of the corridor. There are some locations that uh, restrict parking, notably in front of Wilcox High School. And then in yellow, you can see existing bike lanes that are uh, exist in some locations, but are not continuous along the corridor. So this is a typical diagram of Monroe Street. There are nine feet wide parking lanes on each side of the street, four travel lanes, two in each direction. The outside lanes are 11 feet wide and the inside lanes are 12 feet wide. There's a bus stop, the Route 21, runs every 30 minutes on Monroe. And one thing that we've noted uh, from talking to residents is some folks have said that it's challenging getting in and out of their driveways uh, due to fast moving vehicles and sometimes cars parked right up to the edge of driveways, uh, creating site is distanced issues. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are some bike lanes on the corridor. Uh, they're five feet wide, and uh, this section is typically on the eastern section of Monroe. One thing to note, the, uh, there are bike lanes, but they don't currently meet the recommendation in the city's adopted and council approved recommendation for this corridor, which is to create buffered bike lanes on Monroe that are continuous. And so that's really what we're looking at here as part of the study to figure out how to do that. There's also an atypical condition to point out right in front of Wilcox High School. This is on Monroe between Marchese and Chromite. We've got an existing condition where you have a 14 foot wide travel lane, then a 10 foot wide travel lane, a two way center turn lane that's 11 feet wide. And then on the opposite side of the street from the high school, two travel lanes that are 10 feet wide and a parking lane that's nine feet wide. What we're recommending here is creating a parking protect, or sorry, creating a protected bicycle facility in front of the high school. During our site visit and some of the feedback we received is there are a lot of bicyclists that we need to access Wilcox, but they're doing so by bicycling on the sidewalk because there is no facility for them on the road. So this concept would create space for them to do so. And I'll zoom in here as well to point out, it'd be a seven foot wide bicycle facility with a four foot wide buffer. And inside that buffer, there would be some sort of physical barrier to prevent cars from parking and blocking the bike lane. So here you see like a curb stop, but this could be uh, posts. It could be a continuous uh, curb and gutter that's planted. It could be um, concrete K rail. There's a lot of different design options that the city has that would need to be evaluated with public input during a design phase. So for this, we're just showing a concept in terms of the cross section. Then it would be a reduction from four lanes down to three lanes, one in each direction with a center turn lane. 
and the opposite side of the street, retaining parking, so parking would not be uh, removed, and there'd be room to create a buffered bike lane that'd be six feet wide with a three foot painted buffer. So this is our first concept that would take place in front of Wilcox High School. And now we're looking to get some feedback. So if you could go to minty.com and type in the code 56903478. Again, you might need to open up a separate web browser or use your cell phone or a tablet to take our poll. And we're looking for your feedback about how favorable you find this, this concept. Again, it's taking uh, four lanes, two in each direction, and a certain center turn lane, taking it down to one lane each direction in order to create a separated cycle track, class four facility uh, directly adjacent to the high school, and then a buffered bike facility on the opposite side of the street. So we're asking you to vote about this concept, if you find it a favorable option for the proposed concept or less favorable. Give folks a few minutes to take to vote. Again, if you're just joining us, we're doing a lot of interactive polls to get feedback through the uh, course of this presentation. So if you can go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com and type in the code 56903478, you'll be able to interact with us and provide feedback. All right, get your votes in. Five more seconds, and then we're going to be moving on to a few more concepts. All right, so right now, on a five-point scale, looks like the average from folks that are attending is about a 3.3, .3, so just a little bit more than a neutral favorability for this one. Oh. One more vote came in, just bumps it up a little bit higher. All right, I want you to think about your vote and kind of how you ranked this concept. And we're looking for some feedback. So why did you select that rating? Uh, it could be a couple words. It could be a sentence or two. We don't need you to describe in great length. Uh, you don't need to write a full paragraph, but kind of what do you like? What are you not liking about this concept in terms of creating this bike facility in front of the high school and reducing the number of travel lanes. All right, somebody wrote bike lanes, uh, turn lane. We might need more context during the Q&A session. Uh, maybe it got cut off. Uh, let's see, this makes it safer for those who are walking and bicycling. Uh, all right, and a repeat. Thanks. Appreciate the feedback. All right, here's one that came in. Generally good. Get the bike lane out of the door zone. All right. Concerned about removing car lanes leading to more congestion. Street parking should be maximized. Okay, thanks for that feedback. All right, we'll give about five more seconds to get in those comments, and then we're going to go on to additional concepts. So for the majority of the corridor, not in front of the high school, this is the ex or sorry, this is our first concept that I wanted to share with you and get some feedback on. This is concept one, which is reducing travel lanes, very similar to what we just shared. It's taking that four lane roadway down to a three lane roadway. So you'd have 11 foot travel lanes, one each direction, a 10 foot wide two way center turn lane in the middle. And with that additional space that would free it up to create eight foot wide buffered bicycle lanes. That'd be five feet wide for the bike space and a three foot wide painted buffer. In this concept, we'd retain the parking on both sides of the street. However, you can see at driveways with this concept, we're recommending improving the visibility with adding striped buffers at driveways that would reduce the parking that would be right up against the driveways, making it easier for residents to get in and out 
see vehicles as they're trying to get in and out of the driveways or see bicyclists as well. This could also be a space for receptacles, trash and recycling to be um, uh, deposited so that it's not put in the middle of the bicycle lane. For the uh, bus stops, we'd add green striping on the buffered bike lane to indicate that this is a mixing area where the bus may be crossing over the bicycle lane in order to come up against the curb to uh, let people on or off the bus. All right, so again, this is concept one, Lawrence Expressway to San Thomas Expressway for the majority, except for Wilcox. We're looking for your feedback on this. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. And again, looking for your indication of favorability, less favorable or more favorable in terms of this concept. And then we'll ask about what you liked or didn't like about it uh, in the next slide. So again, you can take the poll by going to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, and using the code 5690347 get 5 more seconds let people make up their mind some feedback from us. So why did you select the rating that you did? All right. One person said, most consistent with the treatment in front of Wilcox. For not having car doors open into the bike lane. Thank you. Would rather not reduce car lanes or street parking. Okay. Consistent with other similar corridors would reduce transitions. Okay. Give folks five more seconds to provide feedback, and then I'll share with you another concept, a different concept. All right, here's our second concept. So similar to concept one, this is reducing travel lanes from four down to three. Very similar, it'd be one travel lane in each direction, that'd be 11 feet wide and a 10 foot wide two way center turn lane. The difference with this concept is that the bicycle lane would be adjacent to the curb and the parking would be flip flopped. It would be floating and that would create a parking protected bicycle lane. Inside the buffer space as well, there'd be some sort of physical barrier uh, to prevent cars from parking uh, against the curb. In this concept, very similar, you can also see there would be improved visibility with striped buffers for places where trash receptacles could be located, also improving the driving driveway experience for people that need to cross over the bike lane or get in and out of their driveways. Also, there'd be a, a bus mixing zone here to reduce conflicts with bus, uh, with the uh, excuse me with the buses uh, needing to park on top of the bike lanes when they need to make those stops. So this is concept two, reduces travel lanes to create space for parking protected bicycle lanes. And here you can see an example of what that might look like. A lot of examples in the Bay Area, in the South Bay, um, and this is kind of one example of what that could look like here on this image. So with that, love to get some feedback about concept two.
Okay, get your votes in. Get five more seconds to make a decision. So it's looking right now for the folks that are joining us tonight, concept two a little less favorable than concept one. I'd love to know your thinking behind how you voted. and share with us your thoughts. All right, one person said, concerned about the removal of car lanes. Good that there are fewer barriers next to cars that cars will accidentally hit while driving. Thank you. Drivers have not figured out how to park in these spaces. Okay, thank you. Scotch bins will end up in this bike lane. Okay, thank you. Better than existing, but parking protected bike lanes will have trash cans and other stuff in them. All right. We don't have a plan to sweep protected bike lanes. All right. Thanks for all the feedback. Appreciate this. We'll leave this open for just a few more seconds. All right, I got another one that came in. Like a buffer between bikes and traffic, but concern over lane reduction causing long backups when school lets out. All right, I appreciate that. And again, tonight we do not have the results of the traffic impacts. We're just kind of getting initial feedback on these early draft ideas. When we meet with the public again at our next workshop, we will be happy to share with you what those traffic impacts would be. We're calculating that right now. So you can see what each of these concepts would do in terms of traffic congestion. So we can share with you those impacts at a later date. Uh, too many driveways for this to work. Need better visibility at conflict zones. Thank you. All right, and here's our third concept. This is removing parking on one side of the street, but it retains two travel lanes in each direction. The travel lanes would be reduced in size. So it'd be 11 foot outside lanes to accommodate uh, larger vehicles like buses, 10 foot wide inside lanes. And we're not saying which side of the street, which side of Monroe would need to remove parking for this concept, but one side of the street would need to in order to create space for buffered bike lanes. And that could be a five foot wide bike lane with a two foot wide painted buffer on one side of the street and then the opposite side would have parking and then a five foot wide bike lane and a two foot wide buffer. There'd still be a bus mixing zone shown on top of this image. Uh, and this trade-off here again is retaining the traffic lanes, but reducing parking. If you recall back some of the analysis we did uh, east of Calabasas, there was typically six out of 10 spaces available during peak periods, but it got a little tighter west of Calabasas. So, we wanted to share this and get some feedback from the public. So looking for your feedback on concept three. This is buffered bike lanes with four vehicle lanes retained. Right, give folks about five more seconds to get your votes in. All right, we'd love to hear your feedback, kind of what led you to vote the way you did.
So he said, removing parking will lead to more parking on side streets, which is very concerning with this plan. All right, thank you. Parking on one side will result in mid-block crossings. All right, thank you. Better than existing, but you're losing the turn lane and four lanes of traffic won't reduce high speeds. Thank you for that comment. Reducing travel lanes probably improves safety for pedestrian crossings. Like this idea, but concerned about equity, how to select which side of the street loses parking. Don't want to lose turn lane, way too scary to turn without it unless you can also reduce speeds. Thank you. All right, that's the last concept to share with you tonight. And so with that, we're gonna go into our question and answer session so we can get a little bit more of a deep dive into some of the feedback you shared, answer any questions you have about the concepts and hear additional feedback that you might have that you wanna share with us. So in order to do this right now, our IT team is gonna activate the raise hand button. You can do that to indicate that you'd like to come off of mute. You can ask a question or provide additional feedback. We also have some questions in the Q&A window. So you can type out a question if you'd like to do that. And we'll, we'll go from both. We'll answer a few questions that people want to say live, and then we'll switch over to the uh, queue of questions. There's always a few that are in the queue. So, with that, I'd like to open it up. I see Zach has got his hand raised. Zach, would you like to uh, go ahead and provide your feedback or ask a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Thanks for being here. Great. Um, I've seen a lot of these uh, bicycle improvement plans in adjacent cities like Cupertino. And something I notice is that a lot of the traffic control structures that they build, which are great for bicyclists, seem to be really problematic for cars accidentally hitting them where like every bollard has been hit dozens of times or every curb is covered with like car debris and i think about the impact this has on the motoring public and i was wondering what can be done with all these designs to minimize or eliminate those impacts it, it seems like putting curbs in the middle of the street leads to the expected outcome that people accidentally drive into them particularly at night or in the rain or people who are unfamiliar with the road thank you thank you zach Great, uh, great question and appreciate that feedback. So uh, I can start and then if, if folks from the city staff are here that would like to, to weigh in, I think a lot of what you're asking about would be handled at a later stage. If this moved forward, there would need to be a very intense design process to come up with exactly what this could look like in terms of some of these bears that you're talking about. Uh, San Jose, Cupertino, they've used flexible posts in that buffer space that I talked about. And you mentioned in your feedback that you've seen them get hit. There's a maintenance issue with those curbs also, if there's not any sort of reflective material at night, hard to see, and you can see a lot of cars getting up on the curb. So that's something that the city staff and the design team would have to look at and think about the different trade-offs when selecting which material to use in that buffer space. Um, there could be lots of different things in terms of curb stops. Um, there could be uh, planters, Again, thinking about you know reflective materials that make sure that people aren't hitting those and low light conditions, all that would need to be considered in the engineering phase. Um, Ralph, did you want to add anything to that? Hi, no, this you're you're right on. This would be a design phase where we would look at how we can implement some of the um, materials without them being 
hit. So as Jeff mentioned, it could be reflective. Um, it could be putting in, make sure the flexible posts. Um, we were looking at some new types of um, dividers that could get hit and have less maintenance. So we're, all, we're looking at all those things. Yeah, I, I think Zach, um, it's a good point, well taken. We're all learning from some of these new technologies and new treatments. And so uh, I'm sure the city will be evaluating what their neighbors are doing and taking the best practices uh, into consideration. And I'd say, even if city council wanted to move forward with any of these concepts at the end of the study, there would still need to be an engineering phase that would involve public input in that design. So uh, rest assured, there's an opportunity to keep weighing in about the, the materials. All right, I see another person's hand raise. Gabby, you're next up. Please go ahead and ask your question or provide your feedback. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the work that's been done here in, in putting this together and presenting it. Um, you know, whichever concept is eventually chosen and implemented, you know, what is, I guess, the project's, you know, uh, what are they going to do about speed? Right, because I think that regardless of whatever concept is put in, the problem, just generally and and especially on on Monroe, is motorists just traveling way too fast for it to be safe, um, and something really needs to be done about that. Um, I think you know I I, I know that there's eighty five eighty fifth percentile loss so anytime you know things are brought up about reducing speed limits or actually trying to implement things to. Um, to slow drivers down, um, you know, that that gets thrown up. I'm not sure what, you know, if the law changed or something. But anyways, I think speed is is a huge factor um, for motorists. So I'm curious what the project is going to do about that. Thank you. Thanks, Gabby. I appreciate that. I I will say that in the next time that we meet, we'll be sharing some of the impacts, not only to traffic congestion, uh, some more information about exactly the number of parking that would be lost with each concept, but also speed information. I can tell you right now that doing the road diet, going down from four lanes to three lanes, does have a speed reduction. Uh, this has been documented in lots of studies across North America and California, because what happens is that instead of uh, having two opportunities, two lanes for people to speed, it puts the safe and prudent driver kind of setting the speed on each direction of travel. And so there has been a, a noticeable reduction between 20 and up to 50% reduction in speeds after a road diet goes in. So there are some speed improvements from that. There's also been documented speed lowering just by narrowing the travel lanes um, from 12 feet wide down to 11 or 10 feet wide can also reduce speed. So there are some things that these concepts can do, and we provide, we'll provide more information about those for the public to evaluate at our next public meeting. Uh, in terms of like other traffic calming devices, some people maybe are familiar with speed humps, speed bumps, um, or other devices like traffic circles. That's not something that we're currently looking at on Monroe, just because of needing to provide um, fire access, but it's something that the city staff could um, take a look at it as well. Those are typically reserved for more residential local streets and instead of this uh, neighborhood collector on Monroe. Uh, Ralph, anything else you wanted to, to add into that? Sorry, no, uh, I think you, you're right. So um, just the natural, if you take away a lane, the natural speed reduction that would happen with that. Anything more vertical like speed humps or bumps or traffic circles, that's probably not um, a feasible outcome for Monroe just because it's a, like uh, Jeff was saying, it's emergency vehicle route. Um, so we would probably be looking at, you know, narrowing lanes or other things we can do to narrow the roadway. Thank you. All right, let's see. Um, I'm gonna go to our Q and A session, uh, but next up we have uh, kind of on deck uh, Edmund, and then Betsy. So first in the Q&A window here, we see a question that comes in. Why are the inside lanes wider than the outside lanes in the first concept? Um, and so I think that's referring to the existing conditions. And maybe um, 
this came from Betsy and Betsy, I see your hand up. So maybe you can explain further. I don't think it's the first concept, but just the existing conditions right now, the, the way that the road is laid out on Monroe, the inside lanes are 12 feet wide and the outside lanes are 11 feet wide. Um, and I don't under, you know, I don't know why that's how they were designed, but the first concept uh, reduces that down to uh, 11 each direction and a 10 foot wide center turn lane. So hopefully that answers that question and maybe we get some more feedback from you in a second. Second question comes in, given that vehicle speed is a major factor in the collisions on this corridor, is traffic calming or speed reduction a goal of this project? Uh, that's a good question. It just came up. I think we've answered that uh, with Gabby's question. Uh, hopefully that suffices to answer your question about speeding and, and how some of these concepts could reduce speeding on the corridor. And the last question that we have currently in the Q&A box, right now there's a westbound bus stop just upstream from the Creek Trail crossing. Is there any opportunity to move it just downstream of the trail crossing instead? It could reduce conflicts. That's something we could look at. It's, it's not quite within the scope of this study. It's a little bit more detail and nuance than we're able to get into, but it's something that we could flag and have a conversation with city staff. And maybe Ralph, maybe you've already looked into this or have additional feedback to, to share about this question. Um, is this about the um, trail crossing? Uh, about relocating a bus stop uh, oh. uh, no. right now, just right now it's upstream of the tr Creek Trail crossing. And, mm. and the question is, have there been any uh, consideration of moving it just downstream of the trail crossing instead? I see. No, we have not looked calls. at uh, we have not looked at the bus stops, but we can we can take a look at that. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks for your patience, Edmund. You're next. Please go ahead and share your feedback or ask a question. Thanks for being available to produce this um, review today. Uh, as, as someone who regularly rides along Monroe, um, um, I can see that bicycles are having some difficulties and I ride a recumbent trike. So I take a little more space than a, a bike does. What I've noticed is that cars that park where it's legal to park, um, they're either very big cars that impinge on the bike path itself or they park rather poorly, repeatedly blocking half the bike lane, and they don't ever seem to be ticketed. Is that not in the list of duties of the police who patrol the area? Because it creates a real safety hazard. You have to swerve out. Now you're in the traffic lane and you could be uh, obviously um, cause a problem either to yourself or to the traffic that's trying to proceed. So, um, I'm really concerned about that. I understand you're changing some of the dimensions here, but perhaps the given the size of cars has increased since the lanes were originally painted, perhaps you need a, where you are going to have uh, allow parking, perhaps you need to give those cars that are going to park, and some of them are pickup trucks, by the way, which are even wider, particularly if they have fancy tires that stick out five inches on each side. Um, so these people, either they need to have some restrictions or you need to give them more room to park on Monroe. Um, the other thing, um, look at my notes here. Um, um, the, the current situation for getting onto the San Tomas Creek Trail is very awkward if you come up South Drive. Um, there really is no legal way to get there. If you come up onto Monroe from South Drive, the entrance to the trail is to your left, but you're already on the left and the bike path is and the cars are coming towards you. So unless you ride on the sidewalk or ride on the bike trail against bike traffic, hopefully there's none when you want to do that, you have no way to get to the San Tomas Creek Trail safely. So what I would like to suggest is that instead of making cars stop right at the trailhead, make them stop on the other side of Monroe. That accomplishes two things. Um, perhaps it's safer then for bikes to make the turn and get to the trail and or they could do the legal thing, cross over, go down, push the button and cross back again. Pretty weird way to have to do it. But it also gives traffic that's traveling two times the speed limit time to stop before they run over somebody at the crossing. So again, what I'm saying is move the traffic light 
that's on the the um, I guess eastern northern side anyway um, away from San Tomas Expressway side the opposite side so you have more time for traffic to come to a stop which would then also let people who are waiting their turn on South Drive in their cars to get over in line to get out and across because that's also dangerous for vehicles to make the left turn onto Monroe from South Drive. Um, and I personally have almost been run over a few times as a pedestrian, um, troubles compounded <laughs> with uh, riding a trike with all my flags flying high in the air so they can see me. So um, that was my, uh, my comments I wanted to share with those who are listening to the call today to um, hopefully resolve some of the issues. And one last thing I wanted to ask for is I agree with everybody that has spoken up on the excess speed. I don't know what the speed limit is today at 30 or whatever. They're doing 50 to 60. Um, and some of these electric cars, they can do zero to 60 in 100 feet. Uh, and they get there very quickly. It's very frustrating. Um, how about a, a um, many cities have a, um, all, all our surrounding cities have a little um, digital sign that comes up. You're doing, the speed limit is 30. You are doing 60. It, tell people what they're doing. Um, caution them. Give them some feedback that they're not doing too well. Um, um, some other way to help uh, motorists understand that they are in danger to themselves and to others by speeding here. Um, I know it's done in other cities. Why not in Santa Clara? That's all I had. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you for being here and, and sharing all those those insights with us. Um, starting with your first uh, comment about the width of the parking lane. That's something we could look at. And that's good feedback for us to take back uh, with the city and evaluate that. One thing that I know is that uh, sometimes wider parking lanes uh, allow vehicles the kind of the feeling that they could be further away from the curb. Whereas if you kind of have that outside parking lane, it encourages people to park as close to the curb as possible. Um, so we should balance that with what you're saying in terms of larger vehicles in those spaces and also blocking uh, spaces in terms of, of enforcement uh, as an idea. So uh, appreciate that comment. Um, second comment was about a lot of a lot of great nuance around the uh, crossing at San Tomas Aquino Creek Trail. It's something that we've heard loud and clear from a lot of different uh, folks during our site visits, during our pop-up events and previous meetings. And so that's something that uh, certainly could be evaluated. It's probably beyond the scope of this study, but certainly if city council wanted to move forward with any of these concepts, that would be a great opportunity during the design phase to take a second look at that intersection and that crossing location. And your third comment was about speeding. Uh, right now, the posted speed limit is 35 miles per hour. We'll have more information to share at our next meeting about kind of what we're seeing in terms of actual speeds, uh, of how people are driving in terms of their uh, the speed that we collected, the speed information we collected, and also what can be done in terms of these concepts. So appreciate all of those comments and feedback and appreciate you being here tonight. All right, let's go to next person with their hand raised is Betsy. Betsy, go ahead and share your feedback or ask a question. Yeah, hi. Um, feel free to jump in if I'm <clears throat> if I'm saying something that uh, if if I'm skipping something that you were wondering about or saying something you don't understand. Um, I'll start by uh, reiterating what Ed just said, which is that at South Drive. South Drive is a uh, is a fairly significant bike route in its own right. So if you know what you're doing, you can get all the way to Mountain View going through uh, via South Drive. And that is not a natural uh, turn. So I stood there and talked to the homeowner on that corner. Um, and, and I think I sent you an email about this. And we watched in the maybe 20 minutes that we chatted we watched at least three people going the wrong way, either in the bike lane or on the sidewalk for that little short segment. Uh, we really need to make the natural thing to do, the safe thing to do, and the legal thing to do all the same thing. Uh, not quite sure what that looks like. It might look like, you know, 20 feet of two-way bike lane right there. Uh, something to, to think about. Um, 
in general, I'm in favor of the lane reduction for the potential speed reduction and also for crossing safety. So um, because of the, I don't know if you're aware, there's a, there's a trail detour going on this month in Santa Clara. So I was crossing Scott Boulevard uh, at, the, at the trail. And cr yesterday morning or this morning, I don't remember which, um, I was, there's a sort of a median and somebody, one of, there's no, not a light there or anything. It's just kind of a <laughs> mid block crossing. Um, but somebody in the left lane westbound, you know, we were standing there in the median with me, myself and one other person on a bike. Uh, somebody westbound in the left lane saw us and stopped for us. And both of us recognized that that was not a safe time to cross because there was a right lane of cars with people in them who couldn't see us. So that's, that's the crossing danger when you have two lanes of traffic in each direction on a street like this. So uh, that's the other reason that I favor a lane reduction is that it eliminates the, the potential that one lane of traffic has people in it that can see you and stop and the other lane just doesn't. Um, and there's video of that very thing happening uh, if, you, if you look around on YouTube. Um, the buffered bike lanes are, are pretty good. Um, Paint is not protection and plastic posts are vertical paint. You can look on Monroe today, there's some plastic posts, they've all been mowed down, even some of the ones that have only been there for six months. So I'm not opposed to plastic posts, but if you're talking about a protected uh, bike lane, plastic posts are not going to stop cars from, from wandering into a bike lane. Um, on the parking protected bike lanes, I think that can work in some places. I think that every time you have a driveway, there's a potential conflict point. And even though you've you've striped this little, you know, sort of uh, clear zone in, in the concepts. Um, well, first of all, I think a lot of people don't don't know how to park in a in a parking protected situation. Um, we have, uh, I, I can find you a photo that somebody in Cupertino has taken of just such a bike lane. And the cars are all sort of crammed into the little buffered area and, and then some. So they're encroaching on the bike lane. And I think that, you know, just nobody knows how to use that facility. Um, but it also creates the situation where, you know, there's a visibility problem at every corner and driveways included. So I am reluctant to, to push that. Um, and I'm also reluctant to push that because we have not yet figured out how we're sweeping um, protected lanes of any kind and they need to be swept because all of the crud gets flung from the roads into, into, to, into the bike lane and the gutters uh, every single time. It's just sort of the mechanics of the thing. So those are my comments, I think. I got everything. Yep, those are my comments. Well, thank you, thank you, Betsy. Thank you for providing that. Thank you for being here tonight to share the your experiences on the corridor and your suggestions for us. Okay, we've got another uh, question comment from the Q&A box. Can you consider a Hawk light at Quinn and Monroe? For the folks on the call that don't know what a Hawk light, it's also sometimes referred to as a pedestrian hybrid beacon. There are some examples of this in Santa Clara on El Camino Real. Uh, I'm sure city staff can also point to other locations. This is a signal that stays, uh, turns off until a pedestrian comes and pushes a button, and then you start to get 
uh, flashing yellow lights, flashing red lights, and then an all steady red light and that stops the cars for people to cross the street. And then it goes back to flashing red, flashing yellow, and then it turns off. So it's like a signal just for, just when it's needed for, for pedestrians to help them get across the street. So this attendee said, can we put one at Quinn and Monroe? It is a wide street to cross on a bike. And with the high speeds, my littlest biker can barely make it across before cars that we couldn't even see when we started approach the crossing. It may also help to reduce speed to have another location where traffic will need to slow or stop on Monroe itself to allow peds and bikes to cross. Kids using this crossing to access Cabrillo Middle School. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, and uh, I believe there's also one of these as an example right in front of the high school at Meadowbrook. Um, so we're looking for some more locations in the quarter. It's beyond, I think, our parameters of this study to recommend individual crossing treatments, but it's certainly something we could note in the study if council wanted to move forward as part of the design, the next design phase, to evaluate some of these crossing ideas and share the feedback we're getting from folks tonight and throughout the, the life of the cycle so we can flag that for, for future analysis and future design work. Uh, Ralph, anything else you wanted to add about this consideration of a hawk at Quinn and Monroe? Yeah, no, I think your uh, response is correct. This is um, our plan study is focusing on the addition of the bike facilities, but we will note your comment about the Hawk suggestion for Monroe and Quinn, and we can take a look at it either through the future design phase for this project or other projects Great. as they come up. Yeah. Good. A good comment and a, a good suggestion. Thank you for thank you for that. All right. Let's see, I see no other hands raised, so we can cycle back if if you'd like to provide additional feedback. Um, I'm going to share with you a couple ways to do that, and we can stick around, of course, if people want to keep the conversation going. I want to share with you real quick next steps. So the the concept survey is now live, and it's got a PDF on the project website where you can go, you can look at these in more detail, you can evaluate them, you can take a concept survey. So very similar to the polls you took tonight. Please share it with neighbors, with other residents on the corridor. If you know folks that work at or go to school at Wilcox, we'd love for folks to take this. Again, we had 67 people take our first survey. We're looking to, to beat that number with survey number two. We have a community meeting coming up on September 23rd, that's a Saturday. So this is the same material that we presented tonight, will be presented on Saturday. We decided to do a weeknight and a weekday or weekend day to make it more convenient for members of the public to attend and hear this information and participate. So if you know anybody that couldn't be here tonight, let them know about our Saturday meeting coming up on the 23rd. It's a QR code right there. If you click on that, it'll take you to the project website. You can also search Santa Clara's website to learn more about many different bikeway studies that are going on. Uh, we also have two pop-up events. We're gonna have one at Wilcox High School. The date is still being worked out. It'll be this fall where we'll be able to uh, have a station and interact directly with staff, faculty, and with students and parents. We'll also be at the Santa Clara Art and Wine Festival. We hope to see you there. We'll be there all day on September 16th. That's this Saturday and the 17th, which is Sunday. So we'll have a booth set up you can learn more about Monroe. There's also going to be other stations for other corridors around the city that the, the city is studying for potential bike improvements. Again, as a reminder, we are in the second meeting out of three. So we'll see you again later in the winter. And at that point, we will have more detail about each of the concepts. We'll be taking feedback and refining the concepts and then sharing that with you, as well as with the city's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to get their input. And at that point, we're gonna to go to council for their review and consideration, and then they'll make a decision about uh, how to move forward and direct staff. Website, if you didn't catch that QR code, santaclarasca.gov slash bike ped projects. You can send us an email, monroestudy at altago.com. If email is not your thing and you'd like to leave us a voicemail message, you can do so by dialing 408-320-7060. Uh, 
Uh, we're not returning calls, but we love to uh, get your information. We'll transcribe it and add it to the record. Of course, you can attend our future community meetings and other engagement events. We'd love for your help in sharing the word. Right now we have signs up along the corridor uh, letting people know about this study. We've sent out postcards, over a thousand postcards to residents uh, in the neighborhood and along Monroe Street. We're using all social media channels through the city. Uh, we wanna make sure we reach as many people as possible that would be impacted or benefit from this project. So please help us get the word out. And with that, I just wanna say thank you We've got a hand raised, so we'll be happy to stick around and keep the conversation going. But if you'd like to drop off and get on with your evening, I just want to say thanks for your time. Thank you for being here and appreciate your involvement. All right, I see Edmund with hand raised. Go ahead, Edmund. Yeah, just real quick, I wanted to follow up on the very um, astute um, feedback from uh, from Betsy on the uh, detour that um, begins at Scott boulevard um i was there a couple of days ago and i had the same problem it's there is a solution which the city has totally ignored um instead of letting riders proceed under the underpass go below scott and then make the u-turn to get on going to the left on scott they force you to make a dangerous crossing across scott this is easily remedied let riders go under the underpass, put the blockage on the other side with an arrow pointing so they come right back and now they're on the correct side of the street. No, no cars are hindered and no bicyclists are run over by racing against two-way traffic on Scott. Uh, I just wanted to share that, that's all I had. I appreciate that, thank you. Ed. All right, I'll, I will leave it to uh, Ralph Garcia if there's anything else you wanted to add before we close out for the evening? I don't see any other questions or hands raised, but I don't want to cut us off early. So if you got anything else to add, please do so now. Otherwise, we look forward to engaging at a future date. Uh, Ralph, anything to close us out? No, um, thank you all for attending, spending part of your evening with us to provide us your feedback. Look forward to seeing you again for future outreach events. And as the project continues, um, we'll provide more details on the concepts. And hopefully you can provide more con more uh, comments at that time. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.